Hello, good evening, and good afternoon to our guests in the U.S., Europe, and the Middle East. I would like to welcome you all today to this panel on behalf of Gulf International Forum. Today, we are discussing a very important topic, and unfortunately, this topic does not get the attention that it deserves. Uh, since the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, millions of Iraqis have been forced to flee their country or have been displaced throughout Iraq. The increased insecurity and later, the sectarian conflict have caused several waves of forced displacement. The most recent one was in 2014 with the rise of ISIS, which, which pushed millions of Iraqis out of their cities and towns in Mosul, Salah al-Din, Anbar, Dayala, as a result of, as a result of uh, the horror inflicted by the terrorist group. Currently, thousands of Iraqi IDPs have serious concerns. Uh, related to their safety and security, ownership of land and housing in their areas of origin, documentation and registration of newborns, reunification with other family members scattered throughout Iraq, exclusion from access to basic services, high rates of unemployment, and many other concerns related to participation in elections and public affairs. On the other hand, facilitating the return of IDPs to their areas of origin is also a major challenge for the displaced community, the international organizations, and the Iraqi government as well. Right now, almost 70% of the Iraqi uh, IDPs say their property is partially damaged uh, from the conflict. And the delay of the reconstruction process in the country has also made returning to areas affected by the war on, on, on ISIS uh, nearly uh, very difficult. Since the territorial defeat of ISIS more than three years ago, Iraq displaced community like most Iraqis have been affected by the political and economic unrest in the country. Insecurity, the increased power of militias and human rights violations are among many concerns of this community. To discuss, uh, 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 today we will discuss the, 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 uh, the challenges facing uh, the, uh, uh, this community, Iraq's internally displaced community. How is the post-ISIS Iraqi political situation affecting them? How does this affect the long-standing reconciliation in Iraq and political reform in the country? Why has the Iraqi state failed so far to end this crisis? And what are the proposed solutions before and after the upcoming uh, elections in December. To address these questions and many more, the forum is hosting today a remarkably well-qualified panelist to help us understand uh, more about this topic uh, and propose solutions. Our speakers in order of speaking today are uh, Rashal Aqidi, Senior Analyst and Head of the Human Security Unit Program at New Lines Institute, uh, Salma Shami, non-resident visiting fellow at Georgetown University's Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, an adjunct lecturer at uh, Global Human Development Program, and Dr. Rochelle Davis, uh, director of Georgetown University's Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. Um, we'll start with Russia. Uh, Russia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anas, uh, for hosting this very important, uh, very important panel and this important discussion. Uh, when we talk about IDPs, international displaced populations locally, we have to also remember that not all of them are equal. So an IDP is anyone who has left their home forcefully, as you mentioned. Uh, some of them, however, were able to integrate and live amongst their new locations, my family included. And these are the people who usually um, were able to either relocate their their careers, for example, their work locations. It was not a problem whether it was in KRG or in Baghdad or in other provinces. They don't share the concern that other IDPs have regarding their children and their schools. So they're calculated with amongst the population that have been relocated and displaced because let's face it, they did start over and starting over is never easy. However, they're not. their situation is not as dire as the other IDPs, which I think are the focus today. And these are the people who um, had their homes completely or partially ruined, as you as you mentioned, and had to relocate, but were not welcomed. And, and by not welcomed, I mean not welcomed in provinces, not allowed to integrate, whether for financial restrictions, a lack of career, they could not obtain the documentation needed in different places, such as KRG would require um, the sponsorship, the same thing for Baghdad and other provinces, perhaps less complicated though. And because of that, they were placed in, in camps. Camps, as we know, are mostly tents or caravans, um, according to their location. 
This has been an ongoing situation for nearly five years, if not more, uh, since the camps have been established and uh, and help has been scarce, but has they have survived mostly on help from humanitarian organizations and such aid. Uh, the Iraqi government has not put this as a priority. If anything, it's become more of a um, a political uh, rivalry between different factions. You said if we find that the camps are closing in some places, they are kept in others, and it kind of shows you um, where the political um, bickering happen ha happens. For example, KRG, they do not, they have not closed any camps, uh, and they do not plan to. And while Baghdad or some people accuse them of uh, profiting off of these situations and demanding finances from the Iraqi government and international community to sponsor these aids. The camps in, in KRG are relatively better in condition than other places, and they're also registered, and they receive aid more frequently. They have slightly perhaps better services regarding electricity and, uh, and other even income that where they're able to go to the local markets, purchase perhaps some produce, and then go back to the camps and sell them where they have a minimal income. So that's the situation in KRG. So far, it does not appear to be under any, any threat, but it's also gradually become overcrowded. And because of COVID-19, um, access to the camps and um, making sure that they receive aid has also become quite a problem. And Bar province is another example where the camps are still the last time I checked, at least, which was yesterday, were still open and they do still receive aid, though much less. They have um, the services because they're connected, electricity and oil and gas. It's all connected to Baghdad, to the center. So it's it's more scarce. Um, the struggles there are definitely more serious. Aid gets to them um, um, a, a lot late later than than the camps in KRG. But they are still uh, but they are still open. And it shows the, us that the local government in Anbar province has refused any pressure to close the camps. Whereas the camps in Ninawa um, and the government and the province itself now pretty much fully under uh, different control of, of, uh, of different militia groups, um, all of the camps there have been forced. I believe that the forced closure of the camps um, has been quite a PR uh, campaign for the Iraqi government. They can now say that they have closed camps, but what this has caused is another type of displacement where they cannot return to their areas for various reasons, these IDPs, whether they're from Ninawa, Kirkuk, whether they're from Salah Haddin, because they're either completely destroyed, they have no place to stay, uh, there are security concerns. There's a local concern that's very specific, I think, to the Middle East context, which is the lack of forgiveness. Um, areas do not want these people, do not want these IDPs, because they feel that they have a fifth cousin who was perhaps uh, with the Islamic State who fought with ISIS and therefore the entire family is shamed and there's a security concern related to that. Um, so for these reasons, these families have not been able to return. The government also did not provide an alternative for them. So they are now basically staying in whatever empty uh, home that they can find that is perhaps even half destroyed. And we have an, an al already in Iraq, there's a phenomenon called the Ashwa'iyat, which I believe translates roughly to random neighborhoods. These neighborhoods um, are just set, they're unregistered, uh, illegal to a huge extent. And it's Iraq's version of homelessness. You know, Iraq's, Iraqis don't want to acknowledge that we have a homelessness issue, but this is the example. This is, this is basically the version of it. And now the IDPs having being kicked out of the camp, have camps having no place to go, are joining the Ashwa'iyat, the random neighborhoods. And we see this popping up in different areas, which uh, has is a new emerging problem uh, for, for Iraq. Uh, another important issue is the documentation, as you mentioned. Um, for areas in Ninawa, Salah Haddin, certain places that were under the Islamic State rule for over two years, all the, the births, during the, that period were registered by the Islamic State and unacknowledged by the Iraqi government. This has been a very, very slow process in solving this issue. They are now, they have now reached five to six years of age. They cannot enter schools. The camps themselves, the remaining camps, and of course the uh, local camps and the unregistered illegal camps do not have educational services. So we're facing now a generation that perhaps will not enter schools and their numbers are within the tens of thousands at least. Uh, this is, these are the points, and I believe that um, the report that we will be discussing later, and I'll leave that to uh, to my colleagues, it covers that thoroughly, and it is it is 
way past time that there's more pressure on the Iraqi government to solve this problem. It's beginning to affect even the most intimate level of, of community coherence and, and, and um, just basically tolerance and accepting of one another within not even different provinces, but within the same city and same town. Okay, so I'll stop right here. And uh, I think I have more comments about the report also as the discussion goes on. Okay, thank you so much, Russia. Uh, Selma, you're muted. Thanks, Anas. Thanks very much for having us uh, today. We are grateful for the opportunity to also speak to this uh, very important issue and specifically about a study that's been conducted by the International Organization for Migration and Georgetown University on Iraqi IDP's access to durable solutions. I should note that um, what Rochelle and I will be presented, uh, presenting today are our own views and don't reflect those of um, IOMs, and that this GU IOM partnership um, has been funded as part of a grant by IOM um, from the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration of the US State Department. Um, we're going to kind of split our presentation into two parts today. I'm going to begin by speaking a little bit about the study purpose and the design, and turn to talking about some of the challenges faced um, by the IDPs uh, in the study and, and the greater population that they represent, and some of the um, solutions that they have engineered to try and mitigate the consequences of their displacement. Um, after that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Rochelle, who will be talking a little bit more about the interventions and the actions needed by the Iraqi state um, to alleviate again um, or bring about the end of displacement um, for this population of IDPs. Slide, please. So our study is based on the Interagency Standing Committee's Framework on Durable Solutions, um, which defined eight criteria that, that tried to answer the question, when does displacement end? Um, and it identified three such solutions, return to the place of origin, reintegration in the place of displacement, or relocation elsewhere. And so based on that, the study tries to assess um, how the experience of displacement uh, changes over time. It's a panel study, meaning we re-interviewed the same families um, uh, who were displaced by Daesh, by ISIL between uh, January 2014 and January 2015. And thus far in that, uh, between March 2016 um, and January uh, 2020, we have conducted uh, five rounds of research um, with the sixth round that's currently underway. Um, it's a mixed method study, meaning that we it has a quantitative survey component that was fielded to all households and a qualitative component um, that was fielded to a subset of the households in addition to displacement affected populations. Uh, importantly, I should note that we have recently released the entire study, including the, the data, the questionnaires, and all of the uh, reports online and the, uh, the websites are listed there. So you'll find um, a lot of what we speak about today in addition to um, more information on the topics that we cover and the data uh, should anyone want to work with it. Slide, please. To tell you a little bit about this population, so the households in the study originally come from one of seven governorates of origin, which is where all of the IDPs in Iraq uh, originated from. Those are Anbar, Babylon, Al -ba Babel, um, uh, Baghdad, Diyala, Kirkuk, Ninwa, and Salah Haddin. And they were displaced to one of four governorates um, where the study was fielded in, in Baghdad, Basra, Kirkuk, and Slemaniye. Of the original uh, uh, 3,852 households, we retain um, just under 90%, so at 3,000. 463 have remained in the study. Um, the survey was fielded in these four governorates uh, where 34% of the Iraqi IDPs reside. And if you look at the map uh, on, on the right, what you will see is that we try to get geographic variations such that um, uh, to, to include areas where there was a dense population of IDPs such as in Baghdad, and also areas where there weren't as many to kind of see um, if, if, if this affected um, IDP's access to durable solutions in any way. And our study here complements a lot of what Russia has already mentioned in that the, the findings generalize to a non-camp population of IDPs. So these are not those who are displaced to camps. These were who were displaced and went outside of camps and who often constitute actually the majority of IDPs in any given uh, situation. Slide, please. We have um, kind of four key uh, challenges and solutions that I'm going to highlight today. The first is that uh, while I, while 
uh, displacement affords um, or is a solution uh, to to this the uh, insecurity that IDPs face in their uh, governorates of origin. It is by no means a catch all solution, and there are negative coping strategies that that. Uh, IDPs have to adopt, and those strategies' effects long uh, outlast the potential end of displacement. The second is that there have been three things that basically have kept IDPs surviving in displacement, and that's their own initiatives and connections, help from the government uh, in terms of compensation, and, and humanitarian aid. But aid has decreased dramatically over the past five years, and, and therefore we're seeing a commensurate stasis in the ability of these IDPs to progress towards a durable solution. Um, two challenges in particular that I will highlight have to do with housing, uh, which poses a significant new um, uh, cost in displacement, and employment, which shows that they're really not getting the jobs they need to, to be able to absorb the new costs that displacement um, uh, poses. And finally, one of you know their own agency IDP's own strategies their uh, their own kind of grit has really been a key factor um, facilitating their ability uh, to survive in displacement slide please so as I mentioned um, displacement is an effective tool to remedy feelings of insecurity as you see between round, the pre-displacement uh, where only 67 percent of IDPs reported feeling uh, completely or somewhat safe um, throughout their time in displacement that that number really rises to, to above 90 percent and very few suggest that they face any types of um, uh, crime in displacement while there slide please um, and while many of them can meet their basic needs, that share never returns to a pre-displacement level. So prior to displacement, 96% say that they can meet basic needs, and that never really rebounds over, you know, 78% at max during that that second year. Of course, the worst year um, while was was in round one when they had just been freshly displaced and when they they didn't really have. Um, uh, the resources yet. And yet meeting that basic needs um, comes at, at a great cost. Slide please. Um, to be able to do so, one of the things they have to do is um, is borrow money. And many times um, they are doing so from uh, relatives and from friends, such that the cost or the burden of displacement really is shared by by the uh, household itself and um, by by its uh, you know the the community surrounding it. Um, up 41 percent, 42 percent, and actually round four decreases slightly to just over a third in round five. But debt is a long term consequence of displacement. And um, one of the things that we see is that while governor uh, government initiatives tend to to address things that cause displacement, like, like repairing homes um, in areas of origin. What, what is slower to come is any type of aid that helps government um, address the problems that displacement itself causes, such as debt. Furthermore, uh, significant proportions of IDPs are reducing food and other expenses. Uh, that really caps at, at um, or maxes out at 35% in our last round of data collection. Um, slide, please. And that's partly a consequence of what we're seeing in terms of um, uh, people's sources of livelihood. So, so while 29% of IDPs worked in agriculture prior to displacement, that number goes doesn't doesn't go above two percent while in displacement. So, so food being expensive could certainly be linked to the fact that not enough, not um, that thirty percent less people are actually working in the sector that produces food to begin with. Um, Furthermore, most IDPs uh, report earning income from informal labor, and that really rises from pre-displacement. It was only about 17, 18 percent. Throughout displacement, it has mainly hovered at, uh, you know, between uh, 30 and 40 percent. And that's a, a, a sector known for kind of its poor working conditions. Um, and while people have found uh, work in the public sector, it's not the same people who are doing so. So the shares are the same, but the, the actual households who are working there are not. Slide, please. Um, and to go back to that point about those working in the informal uh, labor sector, that's partially, um, you know, potentially because 37 percent, so the highest share of all the, the services that we asked about, are reporting that they always or sometimes face discrimination in accessing work. Um, you know, the, the discrimination they're reporting faces uh, facing in these other um, uh, 
sectors and in, in civil services or housing and healthcare and education. They are minority shares, um, but but nonetheless, we have heard really uh, harrowing stories of of people trying to get um, national ID cards or voter cards um, uh, and facing problems because of their displaced status. Slide, please. A second uh, major challenge is housing, where 79% of IDPs owned homes in their places of origin. Um, that completely reverses in displacement, where upwards of 70%, if you look at those who rented alone and are renting with others. And rent is substantially uh, costly. It, it's about um, 20, uh, accounts for upwards of 20% of, uh, of, of their cost of living in displacement. Slide, please. And housing is kind of, it, rep it represents a dual challenge because on the one hand, it's a new cost, but on the other hand, it's also an impediment to returning home. So according to these non-camp um, population, 37% uh, report partial damage, 59% report that their housing has been completely destroyed. Um, and housing is, as Rasha mentioned, it's just one element of this la larger kind of uh, ecosystem of services where uh, many returnees in our study are suggesting that there is no uh, electricity electricity, there are no roads, there are no schools, there aren't the services that make their governors of origin livable. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it here and, and Rochelle will kind of pick up on this point and, and I think begin talking about the fact that compensation is therefore um, one of the key issues that, that the Iraqi government needs to address. Thank you all. And um, it's an honor to be on this panel with, uh, with my colleagues here. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to really try and talk about sort of where we see there are possible interventions by the Iraqi state and to answer some of the questions that Anas kindly um, sort of opened the, the forum with. But I do want to note that neither Selma nor I are political analysts or experts on uh, politics in Iraq in particular. And instead, we really both specialize in displacement and we really try and bring the concerns and interests of the displaced population that have been part of our study into the conversation. Um, and so that's what we're going to focus on uh, most. And I wanna talk about five key areas here and they are issues around compensation, that that is both key to facilitating IDP desires to return and also to inspiring IDP trust in the government and confidence in the government. And then we see that humanitarian aid has all but stopped and that has been replaced with development aid. And that is a real problem and I'll talk about that a little bit more in another slide, but there is no sort of stopgap level between crisis assistance and then longer term development in the country. And that has come as a shock to, um, to, to IDPs when all of a sudden uh, humanitarian aid is removed. Um, the majority of IDP households said they voted in the 2018 parliamentary elections, but among those who did not vote, they report lacking faith in the political system. Many, over half of them do. Um, we also find in, in trying to understand um, IDP, uh, who they trust in, in, in the country, they really trust institutions much more than individual leaders, which is going to be an important um, element, I imagine, of the Iraqi election, uh, forthcoming Iraqi elections. And then finally, they, um, there, we asked a lot about justice and justice needs to be brought into this conversation about in the elections. More than anything, IDPs want accountability for the wrongs committed against them. Justice for them is not a material thing. And I, Russia mentioned some of this as well, that it is really about kind of rebuilding community and to thinking about who committed crimes uh, against them and, and those be people being uh, held accountable for that. So um, compensation is a huge issue and we have focused on it in uh, multiple rounds. Um, it, there is a previous compensation committee um, set up um, and it is this uh, and this was established um, in uh, the post 2003 post-Ba'athist Iraqi government. And the First Amendment law number 20 of 2009 ordered the establishment of this centralized committee. So um, what we see in terms of compensation among um, our study is that really very few people applied in the early rounds, which makes sense. And then when, when Daesh, when uh, ISIS was defeated at, around 2000, uh, at the end of 2017, the Iraqi state seems to begin to make compensation known and widespread. So we see in round uh, in our round four data that 49% people said they applied. Um, now, what is uh, kind of important in this period um, is that the current um, central committee is located in Baghdad um, and the subcommittees were created 
in for each of the seven governorates where displacement happened. And representatives from five government offices sit on that compensation committee. And they are from the High Commission of Human Rights, the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Justice, and the Kurdistan region of Iraq. And there's a sixth member who's a victim's representative. And then the subcommittees in each governorate are headed by a judge, as well as representative from a variety of different ministries. And these subcommittees receive the applications, assess the level of damage to properties, communicate decisions about the applications, and then they decide on compensation claims related to property and anything else that's not property related goes to the central committee. This is a really important part of government that it has gone from central down to sort of the, the, the governorate level. However, what we're seeing in the statistics, if you look, is that there's both an increase in knowledge of, of the compensation committee and what it can do. And then there's an increase, a huge increase in people applying to the compensation committees. But in round four, virtually nobody um, had, had received um, any sort of response on their compensation application. And, and in round five, which was which was fielded at the end of 2019 and into 2020, that only 7%, um, sorry, only 9% um, of claims had been accepted. 7% were rejected and 84% people were still waiting or had been asked for other data or documents, et cetera. This is a real problem because people, you know, because people can't rebuild as you saw from the statistics around around the destruction of housing, people don't just have money to rebuild. And this is one of the things that, that will help the process uh, move along. But if the government doesn't move the process along faster, it, it, people, individuals can't, can't just rebuild their homes. It's also a real opportunity for the government to say, we care about you, Iraqi citizens. We want, you know, you have our, our, our trust and our faith. Um, in you as citizens, and we want you to trust and have faith in us. And so there's a there's a potentially missed opportunity there um, if the if the if the compensation doesn't sort of kick into gear. Um, the we do look forward to what round six says about compensation because um, that will be an important uh, change uh, or not, um, depending on what it says. Now, IDPs provide insight into their experiences. And as you see here, um, and from what um, Selma was talking about, humanitarian aid was really critical to their ability to navigate and survive displacement and to also stay out of, out of camps. Um, but, and we see that aid was an early and temporary fix. And as Selma said, this sort of triangle of IDP, you know, self-initiatives, government support, and then humanitarian aid was what kept people afloat. You see in this these statistics what has happened, and in round four where it drops, you know, in a in a in, in a year in less than a year, you know, it drops by you know over sixty percent um, of people saying they receive aid, and this is this is general aid from you know government aid all the way down to sort of a local charity um, and everyone in between, including international aid. Um, we know that aid has shifted to more development aid for infrastructure for businesses, but this like sudden um, shift and change really caught IDPs unaware. And then the, it, that combined with the slow movement on compensation has meant that people just don't have enough to get by and certainly don't have enough to return. Um, and this is really where compensation can be important. We also see that rebuilding needs to go hand in hand. And a lot of the IDPs talk about how important it is not only to rebuild their homes, but to also have schools and hospitals and roads Re, re, around where they live so that they can return to normal. And so these two things need to be done hand in hand. Um, in May uh, 2018, we see that 56% of our heads of households in the study voted, 50% um, of who they represent voted, sorry. And among the 44% who didn't vote, there are two important uh, trends to note. First, the majority, 53%, said they had no interest or faith in the political system. This is showing that politics is not working for them. And it, it's tied also to the low levels of aid that they, you know, that 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 they are suddenly receiving um, and that had changed for them. And it is also tied to um, sort of no movement on compensation. They apply, they apply, and nothing happens. And then secondly, we see that 35% of those who didn't vote didn't do so because of a technicality. Literally, they they say they couldn't apply for or they didn't receive the biometric card. And that's a problem. And that's hopefully one that can be fixed for the upcoming election. 11% couldn't travel to the voting location, which is either a financial or some other kind of issue. And I imagine we're going to see more of that, both due to the difficult financial situation of Iraqis in this, um, in this uh, throughout the pandemic and all that has happened to them, as well as COVID-related issues related to families. So 
um, something to, to be aware of and, and keep our eye on. Um, and then finally, voting also thinks, uh, brings us to think about trust in government. Um, and as shown in the, these right, round five responses, the police, the courts, um, as institutions, evidence much greater levels of trust of the IDPs than leaders, than religious leaders, tribal leaders, or the prime minister. So you really see a trust in institution as opposed to sort of an individual or a person in a position of power, which is... Um, and then the last slide and um, last uh, discussion issue here is what justice means to IDPs. And we asked about this across uh, four different rounds. And what you see uh, the most uh, common response and consistently over time is that they wanna see the perpetrators of wrongs committed against them brought to justice. What this really means is that justice is not material things to them. It isn't necessarily compensation, although that is important. It isn't um, you know, having their land back, although that too is important. But it really is about, as, as, as Rasha mentioned, and, um, it, it really is about this sense of, I know the people who did you know, sort of bad things to me and my family and my community. And I, they don't, people don't talk about Daesh as outside invaders, although there are people, there are them, but it is, they do talk about them as, you know, people that they knew. And it is an opportunity for the government to bring these perpetrators to courts and try them and sentence them. It's really, um, this could underpin an important national conversation um, about, about, what has gone on. And it's an opportunity to bring about a national dialogue aimed at not just righting wrongs, but also helping people again to sort of sort of believe again in the nation and the state if that's um, if that's what the government indeed wants. And I will finish there and um, we can answer any questions um, that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Davis. Uh, Russia, um... Uh, I'm going to take my privilege as a moderator. I'm going to ask you uh, my question uh, before the uh, audience question. So you mentioned something about uh, 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 IDPs are facing a lot of displacement uh, uh, as they are being forced out of the IDP camps. And they are going to Ashwaiya. I think the closer I can translate is slums, something like slums mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, are we seeing in a, another demographic shift in different areas in Iraq? Is there any tension with the host community? Uh, basically, because these, this displaced community is, is sharing the, 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 the services with the host community. Uh, how is that affecting uh, the areas hosting them and the IDP community? So in the IDPs that, were, uh, that initially had relocated to Baghdad, um, these are the ones, and they were not they were not large in number. They were perhaps the least, but their numbers are between five thousand and fifteen thousand. I believe that was the last time we checked. Th these are statistics from last year, and these are the ones that have joined. And yes, I think slums is the correct translation. Uh, they have joined these communities, and uh, many of them, they even though they do have documentation and ID cards, because they are not uh, they don't they were not born in Baghdad. They don't have residency there. That's why they, they remain in these areas. Of course, the, the resources there are um, and the services there are, are almost non-existing. That's why they're called slums. However, because they do have more access to the kind of manual labor that uh, Rochelle and Sema mentioned, uh, so for them, it's preferable to actually stay in these slums uh, versus going or attempting to go back to their areas. Um, regarding uh, the other provinces, they're creating new slums now and these are out of half built homes or homes that have been destroyed and left um that are that have been destroyed but they at least keep a roof on top of their heads we're seeing this in different areas specifically in the outskirts of the cities so they don't directly intervene they don't directly enter the neighborhoods or the, the urban areas of the city but we do see them on the side and sometimes, and there are attempts to have them also forcibly removed by security forces, but most of the time they just turn a blind eye to them as long as they're not entering the urban areas and uh, causing some kind of discomfort for the populations there. The, the thing about IDPs, and I just wanna add this quickly, is that because there's no international law that protects them, um, there, we, there is an international law and a resolution regarding refugees, but regarding IDPs, there is nothing um, specifically for them. So they're guard basically by the international human law and basically by the also by the law of, of, of the engagement during war, um, which is, I know there's a name for it. 
trying to see if I wrote it down. I did not write it down. But um, there's a there's a law, you know, the uh, basically war um, regulation by by the United Nations. Uh, but IDPs they don't have they there is nothing that really compels governments uh, to to solve this issue. Um, this is something that perhaps the international community, the United Nations, can look into. Um, more seriously and apply more pressure on governments to work uh, to work on this point. Uh, for example, um, during one conversation last year with an official, when we brought up the points of the slums, the answer was, well, that's better than nothing. I believe if there was more of a severe law or serious law, that would not have been the answer of the official. Actually, that leads me to one of my questions was also that, as you mentioned, there is, there is a legal framework, the 1951 uh, convention that provides protection to refugees. However, as you mentioned exactly, IDPs, there is no legal framework that provides them and, and they fall under the mandate of legal protection from the government, their own government. Uh, what can the international community do, the international organizations? I mean, they lack the legal framework, but for instance, Gaudini, Prime Minister Gaudini was in in Europe uh, last week, uh, and, and is there any uh, proposed solutions, either from Russia or the uh, other panelists, to uh, to help uh, uh, you know bring more stability to to this community? No answer. Okay. Uh, Do we have anything to say? I'm happy to try uh, okay. and say something. Um, Again, with the caveat that I'm not a political commentator on this, but you know, there's a very robust Ministry of Migration and Displacement that has been working um, for 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 many years now, it, and this is kind of what we hear from the IDPs is, you know, they, they as Russia says, they're kind of sort of forgotten. They're they're on the on there. Many of them are who there are ones who have. Who are not going to go home, who are who have found jobs and who are integrated and who are there and who are and, and they are Iraqi citizens and and those are the people who we might um, sort of recognize as just Iraqi citizens who have been displaced and who are moved. What we really want the government and others to be concerned about are the are the people of concern, the people who are not surviving, who are not in healthy living situations, who don't have jobs, who's who are open to exploitation and to people being just really awful to them, right? And so somehow it's those people that need solutions. Now, whether those are, are <clears throat> government grants, whether that is government housing, and as Russia said, some people may not want to return because there are no jobs in the places where they, where they are from. So unless the government does the rebuilding in the places that they um, are from, or, in, I mean, Selma showed the statistics of 29% of our study was involved in agriculture um, as, as a, the main source of income before displacement, and now that number is less than 1%. That's a problem, right? That's a problem for all of Iraq if the, if the agricultural sector is not sort of built. And so I think rather than, I mean, there's a way to look at it on the individual level, but there's also a way to look at it, it on the, you know, Iraq has such a long history of of um, investment in kind of the growth of the state and in the population and in saying the agricultural sector, we want to we want to build up the agricultural sector and make sure it works. We you know, or we want to build government housing. And this is going to the, the first people eligible for it are those below the poverty line and who have been displaced. So these are kind of projects or the micro loan sector. These are kind of projects that the government could take on with international funding and financing or pressure or any of those sorts of things. And that's, I think, where the government can make an intervention that would, would fundamentally change many of these people's lives. If I might add there, um, part of, I think, the, the puzzle is is to consider uh, time horizons. Um, uh, in the slide that Rochelle showed on compensation, where we, uh, by round five, only had had 84% kind of waiting for results, part of the problem is that um, in 2016, I think, it, 
they were only getting to compensation claims that were filed 10 years earlier. Um, and, and part of this kind of the forgotten piece is that because Iraq has, has multiple waves of displacement, kind of the older ones uh, get forgotten. So one of the pieces that could be an intervention, and I think a lot of um, or some reconstruction plans take this into consideration, is that there has to be a stopgap measure between um, you know, immediate crisis assistance and long-term developmental aid planning, that there's this middle-term horizon um, where people are not settled enough yet to, to start thinking about long-term rebuilding. There isn't the infrastructure to start uh, investing in kind of small and medium enterprises. There has to be this, um, this middle piece that lets people transition from crisis moment and I don't have a place to sleep and I don't have a blanket and it's freezing outside to, um, you know, I can set up shop and create a business. And I think that's where kind of some of these efforts need to be focused, particularly because of this issue of overlapping um, uh, overlapping wave waves of displacement. Okay, thank you. Um, Salman, you mentioned something about housing. Uh, actually, uh, uh, there is a from my experience working previously for ten years with displaced communities, housing has always been one of their main, if not the main, uh, in in many cases, the main concern. Uh, and mainly when it comes to the most vulnerable groups within these communities, uh, unaccompanied minors or elderly alone, uh, sometimes uh, people with specific needs. Uh, and has there been in your, in your reports, has there been uh, an extra emphasis on, on these uh, groups, uh, mainly when it comes to the housing situation, considering that they require specific uh, uh, arrangements? Or if you can give us more, uh, get us more in the background of uh, uh, how has this been resolved uh, within the community? Uh, has there been any community solidarity uh, 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 when it comes to giving aid to the most vulnerable groups or to the to the community to, to any new arrivals when the displacement happens again? Um, I can speak briefly, yes. just anecdotally, about Muslim in the west side of the city, as we all know, it was destroyed by far more than the east or any other area. Uh, there are certain neighborhoods and certain homes that are that have been rebuilt. And to be honest, they look quite brand new. And much of this aid was not from the government. US aid played a huge role in it. Also, uh, uh, various uh, humanitarian groups in Europe. And a lot of it was private donations that was collected by a very active civil society uh, in the city that um, collects different donations from all over the world in addition to uh, wealthy locals. And they have um, there have been entire street blocks that have been, been rebuilt and uh, rehabilitated that people have been able to return to. The focus is that none of this was government money. And it's something that they've also taken pride in, in that mostly kind of rebuilding itself without assistance. Uh, what this has been, uh, what this has also created was sort of a return to a phenomenon that was back a domestic, very local um, uh, class division in the city that was very uh, prominent back in the 50s and 60s, where it was the wealthy families in Mosul, historically wealthy, that have been in the city for four, four to five centuries. They were the kind of the leader, they were the community leaders. Um, that phenomenon died in the 70s and 80s with the um, obvious control of the Ba'athist regime and um, up until 2003, now we're seeing it having a comeback because now these families are rebuilding homes. So they have some kind of influence and leverage over people. Now, this is not necessarily me saying it's a bad, um, it's a bad phenomenon. It's just a, something that is new that we have to take into consideration because it will impact politics. It will impact who people vote for. It's also, um, we might find these families allying with certain politicians. So this is a new leverage, a new kind of door of influence um, in, in Mosul. I'm not sure how the situation is in Ambar, but I have heard that it is very similar, specifically with the um, the uh, speaker of the of the Iraqi parliament, Halbusi, Muhammad al-Halbusi, a very influential man, obviously. And it's the same situation where his allies have taken the initiative to rebuild certain areas. Um, and it's, if possible, I just want to comment quickly on a, on the question before regarding the international uh, the international uh, framework. Um, if, if we look at the situation, whether it's in Iraq, Syria, Libya, 
IDPs globally have have quadrupled over the past few years, and I do think it's a, it is about time that United Nations and the international communities do discuss a specific framework for this, because right now they are even more in number than refugees. Um, immigration has become increasingly difficult, so people are choosing individuals are choosing just to relocate within their own state, um, and it's it's quite surprising that there has not that this discussion has not been had, where there is a requirement for a legal framework. Uh, that would compel governments to to work um, to work on these issues. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Um, yes. And so. on the issue of housing, our study actually shows that three things happen, none of which are um, particularly encouraging. The first of which is that upwards of about twenty to thirty percent in the first year of displacement suggests that they are staying with family and friends. Um, so so until they can find a uh, find a place on their own. But the second thing that happens, um, so sorry, that also means that the burden, again, just like borrowing money, is falling on really close circles to the displaced, that this burden is not being kind of carried by a, a larger group of agents or individuals. The second piece, though, is that a lot of them, I think, as you saw, actually have, while uh, owning homes by themselves, where in their places of origin, end up having to rent with other families or rent with extended families as one potential way of coping with the fact that they can't cover expenses. But the third phenomenon that we've also seen is that even those who kind of live in apartments, some of them are, um, I think, as, as Russia has alluded to in Muslim, we've seen this in the governorates um, included in our study, is that there are uh, about 20% report paying zero, zero dollars or zero um, Iraqi dinar in rent. So that means that somebody is basically hosting them. They live in an apartment um, without paying. But again, uh, the, the burden of displacement is shouldered kind of by community. Um, and by community support systems rather than having institutions come in and, and lift it up. Anas, could I add something else to what uh, my colleagues have just said? Yes, please. So um, we did a, a specific study just looking at female headed households. And so that, that so far is the only kind of uh, along with compensation are the only specific reports we've done. We have more in the works and they will be coming out. But um, I think I want to build on, I have two points to make. One is to build on what Selma was talking about with shared housing. And we see this particularly, I, I'm responsible for the qualitative um, material that we have. And uh, we have interviewed the same fam the same 100 families from round two to round five. And so we, we have um, life stories as people transition through what they are experiencing, including return and moving again. But this issue of shared housing, has been particularly acute um, around issues of education for children. And so, you know, people say, this is before the pandemic, people say, I send my kids to school, but then they come home and there's no place for them to study because we are three families in a three bedroom apartment and it, they're just, it's just not the right environment for them. So we tend to see this kind of child dropout or, or, or not a lot of success in education because the families cannot support their kids there. Now, during the pandemic, when everybody was supposed to do some sort of online education and there were different options in different places, this was just a whole nother issue and even even you know magnified the, the the issues people faced as well as health issues as well so um the second point i want to make is in following people's stories uh, over time these same 100 families in the four different um that, that took refuge in the four different um uh, governorates of our study we were not knowing what to expect, but we were also really, um, if you if you go through and you read these stories, they are full of people having negative uh, experiences with the host communities around them or with, you know, sort of the police thinking that they're, that they're Daesh members or these sorts of things. And they are full of sort of incredible generosities and kindnesses. And, and, and one of the things that I think my colleagues and I, because we work with, with, with different people have taken away is just our incredible sort of our, our awe and amazement at the Iraqi population and what they have suffered and how they have remained able to take care of each other and care for each other. And some of the stories are so 
moving, I have to, uh, we, we do the translation of the stories on the Georgetown side and we have to like, I, I kind of do a little counseling with, with the, the students who work on the translations and be like, don't translate too many because you can, they can make you really sad. And there's some of them are really hard. And then some of them are just, are just joyous. I mean, there's stories of people who are like, yeah, we had to move out of our apartment and we didn't know what to do. And then I came home and our apartment was empty and nothing was there. And I didn't, you know, and I didn't know what had happened and our neighbors wanted to keep us. And so they moved us to a different, larger apartment and they did it all for us. And wasn't that really sweet of them? And I mean, so there are these kind of stories where people are, are, are finding and rebuilding community. And, and, you know, I mean, I know it sounds like a truism, but there's, or, you know, there are bad people everywhere and there are good people everywhere. And this is really coming out, I think, through these experiences because, our, the team leaders who have led the studies have also said like, you know, I've been doing this for five years and my biggest takeaway from this is, oh my God, this could be me at any time. We could also be one of these displaced people. And therefore it's really important for us to understand kind of these, uh, these relations. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can't agree more, Professor. I mean, the uh, uh, support system comes from the community itself is is way more important than the government and the international organizations and the civil civil society. Uh, that's through my experience professionally and personally, and it's 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 definitely the uh, always the main driving tool for uh, uh, providing whether uh, healthcare, uh, living, housing, protection tools. Uh, my next question is about the human rights violations and access to education, access to health care. Uh, children who are displaced uh, also, do they have access to school? Uh, how is the access to clinics and hospitals? Uh, is there, uh, uh, I, definitely there is a pressure on the healthcare care facilities. Uh, also the, the human rights violations from the militias, popular mobilization units and others in, in Anbar, Salah al-Din, Mosul. Uh, how is that uh, affecting returning? How is that affecting IDPs in the camps or maybe in the in the cities who are displaced in the cities? Anyone? Rasha, I'm looking at you. I'm expecting you to uh, say something about it. Uh, yes, uh, Salah al-Din province um, is is perhaps the the most severe when it comes to this, where there are entire um, towns that have been depopulated and neighborhoods and people cannot return and they have been displaced for several years now. And the government, the local government and the, the militias in charge are basically telling them, go find a life somewhere else. This is all, this also applies to certain places in Diala province. In Ninawa, it's, it's less severe um, where there are, however, um, villages that, for example, in Sehel Ninawa, which um, the Ninawa Plains, which used to be historically um, all Christian, um, Assyrian and, and Chaldean villages are now, um, there's a depopulation there where the locals are prevented from returning in large numbers. They have permitted some to return, but mostly there is a demographic change where families from the south are now coming in and living. And these dynamics consistently change because these groups themselves, the militias and certain political parties, their plans also change. So the more that they have ambitions and have um, plans to um, affect demographic change in these areas, we will see the suffering and, and um, the prevention of returning to homes, we'll see that increase. Regarding the human rights violation, this was something we documented uh, year after year um, during my time in Erfas, so like, um, that uh, violations from abuse to um, certain types of slavery committed by some of the security forces. There were some women, particularly the, um, the widows, um, that um, had to resort to offering um, sexual services in return for some food, water, shelter, and some level of protection. Um, very heartbreaking stories that uh, the families themselves and the people that we spoke to they have washed their hands clean of, of achieving justice against the security forces or the people forcing them to do this. Uh, some of them were not security forces. Some were actually tribal leaders or just influential people that were protected by, by the status quo of the state. They don't think that justice um, is anywhere near or the people, their um, abusers are too powerful. Uh, however, they were more concerned about their children. And this was one particular mother who said, um, I'm willing to suffer everything. It's, it's. I've been through it all, but I just want my child to have an education. 
and this kind of um, one of you asked about education. It depends on on the camp itself, the services within the camps in uh, KRG in Suleimania, for example, the caravans there, where electricity they have electricity. In, a little, I think it's six to eight amperes of electricity, but it is around the clock. There are also, um, there's also better access for organizations to provide some sort of education and sometimes even um, psychological support for these children and for the women. Um, but when you go to Anbar province and you go to the, the you know, slum areas, definitely, uh, this is completely lacking. Uh, everything from running water to um, clean lavatory and clean facilities, unavailable. Um, access to health services are also very complicated because for those who don't have IDP, who don't have documentations, documentation, um, it's hard for them to access hospital and health services. It's impossible to get their children in schools. Uh, so they, they rely mostly on volunteers, um, that, you know, young women, young men who come into these camps and uh, do their best to train these children and teach them. Some of them are not even qualified, but for them, it's the only option. Um, I think psychological support for these children is very important if we want to think about overcoming. When we have a generation that feels that it has been forgotten by society, as Dr. Rochelle uh, pointed out earlier, um, and they might be kind and children and um, they're living with generous family members for now, but in the future, as we've seen in other places, this does build definitely contempt and discontent with the community, with the larger community. And we might be we might face a different kind of problem in the future. Uh, this is something that the government has does not seem to work at, that organizations are very exhausted and are very stretched and um, have attempted to provide some kind of help and some kind of support. But sometimes also they come, they feel short of it. And the violations, as long as um, there is the culture of impunity in Iraq, we will not see this, this end. It's a source of money for them. It's a source of pleasure and service for the people who do this and they are not held accountable for it. So we will see this continuing. The closure, one of the reasons actually the camps were closed was this was the government's way of putting an end to these kind of abuses, that if we just closed the camp, that the people who had access to these vulnerable humans would no longer have access to them and we can protect them in that way. That caused the side pro different side problems, but that was one of the ways that the government um, attempted to, to stop this. Uh, thank you, Rasha, uh, Dr. Davis or Selma. I uh, you mentioned about you mentioned uh, uh, part of the uh, 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 the requirement to move on is the uh, seeking justice. Uh, IDPs they they basically wanted justice. They basically uh, uh, were were asking to uh, to find the remedy and, and and put an end to this uh, to what they have faced. Uh, would you like to add anything about uh, human rights violations or what they have been exposed to uh, before or during the displacement? Salma, you want me to take that? <laughs> I'll, I'll say something and then you can add. Uh, what Whatever you want, yeah. yeah. Um, those are not uh, a lot of issues that we studied in in this study, so it's harder for us to comment on that. I will say um, we've, we're working on a paper on education and access to education, and it's pretty common. Um, I mean, it's known that for the most part, in a, in most conflicts, not all conflicts, the children who are displaced face are are enrolled at lower levels of in school. Now, Iraq has this long history of of high levels of education, and so we are we do see among displaced populations a much lower levels of enrollment in schools. One of the good things about what Iraq has done is they have tried to incorporate IDPs into the regular school system, and including in the KRG, and they have also set up Arabic schools in the KRG for for students with the idea that they wouldn't have to learn a new language and start learning in a, in a um, and it, with the idea that they could go back to their um, places of origin and still be caught up. However, this has meant that schools are, are have huge enrollments. And um, as the Russia said, in, in some places, the schools are damaged. In some places, the, the sanitation facilities are just awful. Um, and so people, sometimes people are, are reluctant to send their kids to these places because they just, they, they, they don't learn and instead they just get, you know, um, kids are sometimes bad to each other so they get beat up or other things. We're also seeing um, families making decisions about 
who who among their children stays in school. And there's a pretty um, strong trend that it is that everybody gets a little bit of school, but older children get pulled out of school so that younger children can 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 get you know through the sixth grade or something like that. And so boys are being pulled to um, start working, or the boys themselves volunteer to start working and support the, their younger children um, in in school. Girls are being pulled because it costs money to send uh, kids to school, or they're being pulled because par uh, parents don't think that girls should, you know, be educated after the sixth grade or something like that. So there are differences um, uh, based on gender, um, but we do but we do know that IDP children are at much lower levels. Um, the one thing that we're also seeing, there are other age trends that, and, and they will be out in the report that we will put out or the paper that we will put out. Um, I'll add just two things there. So we actually have written on this already um, in the, uh, if you look at our um, our report on five years in displacement, um, it, it is higher than other populations, but our, our round four, okay, so our round four, uh, round five report actually talks exactly about these two issues, NS, that you asked about um, healthcare and displacement, and this is notably pre-COVID and uh, education and displacement. And what we've actually found is that um, uh, it, it, 16, approximately 17% of households uh, in this non-camp population have suggested that their uh, children's schooling has been disrupted on account um, uh, of, of being displaced. Um, that is high, but comparatively speaking, um, you know, it, it has been higher among other populations. Um, we, in terms of access to healthcare, as as I mentioned, um, it isn't one of the key places where our um, IDPs are facing discrimination. That said, among um, those who needed healthcare in our in in round five, so in 2020. Um, it's about 40% uh, to 42% who actually suggest that they're having trouble accessing it. When you ask about why they're having trouble accessing it, it's again a financial issue. Um, so, and this is particularly problematic because as you know, uh, in displacement, you have people who have, you know, sickness that, that comes up, um, you know, uh, over time, but also you have chronic illnesses. So um, chronic illnesses that aren't addressed create problems later on. Um, and actually, most of the, the IDPs report that the illnesses that they do have that needed to be addressed are chronic. Um, our current survey is going to talk kind of all about this in the context of COVID-19. And hopefully, um, those those results will be uh, out a little later. Um, with respect, as Rochelle said, we don't ask uh, head on about um, uh, it, it, the, the, the human rights piece, we, we ask slightly about that in terms of asking kind of um, what are some of the, um, the, the, the rights abuses that they have, uh, that, that, that families have experienced. And there are harrowing stories in, in the qualitative um, uh, interviews about, you know, people being separated from, from family members or, or running so quickly out of the house that they forgot somebody and then being reunited at the border of a governorate. Um, in terms of specific abuses, the number one uh, thing that, that comes up, 20% of uh, IDPs in round five suggested that, that um, you know, the, the incursion of, of ISIL had disrupted career paths or um, their own career paths or, or, or career paths of other members of the family. Approximately 10% rep, uh, reported that they had had a, the death of somebody in their um, first circle, so a, a parent or a spouse of a child. Um, an additional 12% said another uh, another family member had 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 somebody die because of the ISIS incursion. About six or seven percent said they had someone um, that had been kidnapped uh, or had been disappeared. Uh, Fourteen percent said that they that a member of the family had um, uh, had 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 experienced a um, disruption to their education. So so you know the the percentages might not be large, but there are many ways in which lives have been disrupted and many rights that have to be wronged. And I think in light of that, it is, it's all the more, um, I, I don't know the right word for it, it it's profound that, that still people are, um, you know, people want justice 
in terms of persecuting criminals, not in terms of money, not in terms of repair my life, because at the end of the day, you know, there is no reparation on earth that's going to bring back the loved one uh, or, or bring back years of school lost or bring back a career that somebody had been building. So so that justice um, in terms of seeing someone um, uh, uh, kind of kind of. Uh, brought to to bear the full consequences of their actions is is really what is most important to them. Thank you. Rasha, I have a question about the budget allocation. I know every year there is some controversy happens in the Iraqi parliament and, and like uh, the budget allocation for the different uh, Iraqi uh, governorates, provinces. Uh, the, 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 the provinces that was affected mostly in the war against ISIS, uh, has there been enough allocation for uh, reconstruction? What is the uh, status of the reconstruction plans? A few years ago, there was a, a reconstruction conference in Kuwait and billions of dollars were pledged. Where are we right now? Is, the, is this also uh, some, uh, I mean, a topic that is being used in the political agenda in the upcoming elections? There is so much happening about it, and I mean, so much discussion happening about it in the uh, social media. If you can give us more. Yes, absolutely. Uh, regarding the the the, con the donor the donors conference at the time a few years back, uh, yes, billion dollars were pledged, but none of the, that money really went through um, because Iraq was unable unable to. Um, to address the corruption issue. So many countries decided to back off or perhaps postpone, postpone uh, the donations for as long as possible until that problem was solved. Um, the irony of the, of the budget is that every single year, um, the provinces of Salah al-Din and of Ninawa um, that whom, and Anbar that were destroyed and affected mo most, mostly um, by the campaign to liberate these areas from ISIS, they always received the least budget. And um, other provinces in South Iraq that have um, one-fifth of the number of population receive a higher budget. Um, that's mostly political, uh, and the reasons for that, the government has not really offered enough explanation. There is another thing is that the, the services on South Iraq are actually, in many places, even worse than they are in the areas that were uh, liberated from ISIS. And it just shows us that overall services in Iraq, with an exception to very, very few areas, are overall really bad. And there's hardly one Iraqi who has um, life better than the other. I think if you are an Iraqi under the poverty level, this, the suffering is similar, whether you're from Nasriya, Basra, or from Ninawa. Um, the thing is also is that um, the the reconstruction plan is not allocated within the budget. So what, what, the budget is just for the main services. And, um, and government employee salaries, which these provinces have less than others. But the, the reconstruction um, uh, money, that's, that's a loan that's allocated by itself. There is um, a significant amount every year, but we don't see any of that actually coming to life. We don't see the results of it. Another indication of corruption in the country that hampers all of the plans that, um, and all of the possible solution that uh, to this problem. Now the IDPs, Iraq is not the first country to suffer from it. And the money is there to actually um, create feasible solutions, whether short term or long term to solve it. But there is a lack of political will. There is the consistent use of, of the IDPs as elections approach. You find that um, the politicians from these areas, from Ninawa, from Salah al-Din and from Anbar, they suddenly remember the IDPs and they do use them in their campaigns. So they, they need to keep, not to keep the, the, the problem alive, but there's just so little interest in it because the priority is actually, um, there is money for them, there is room for corruption, there is room to, um, to basically hijack that money. That is the priority, that is what the focus is on and not really in helping and solving this problem. Uh, it will I think I believe that this will continue until communities are self-sufficient and they can solve it at, to, a, to a point where it does not become a problem. Um, we hope that that actually happens soon before uh, this young generation grows into uh, come, comes to age, you know, 18, enter the 18 and 20 year olds when they have been displaced all their lives. That is a huge, huge problem. Um, 
And until then, I don't think they know at this point that they cannot rely on the government. They do, yes, they do trust the institutes, perhaps to some extent, uh, but they don't see the in, they don't see the effect of that. They don't really see that these institutions have served them. There's more, um, and this is just my analysis, um, and I could be completely wrong. I believe there's more dislike of in individuals than there is actual trust in institutions. Um, there is absolute loathing and mis mistrust of the government. Uh, they're not expecting and anticipating anything from them. And every year when this budget issue comes up, this discontent actually shows. Thank you, Rasha. My last question before we go to closing remarks, the COVID, how COVID-19, how the pandemic, how did it affect the IDPs? Did they have equal access to vaccination, uh, tests, all types of prevention, medical uh, uh, support, mainly the vaccination right now? I know Iraq is not doing very well in, when it comes to vaccination, but overall, did they have equal access to vaccination? or that hasn't been uh, maybe this is this is not stay yet. tuned we'll we'll have data on this uh knock on wood uh, uh in a couple of um hopefully in a couple of weeks we've we've asked about this and um kind of the challenges that uh COVID has posed of course uh, given where we started given difficulties in accessing healthcare and education and these difficulties um in uh in in accessing um uh, jobs um, uh, that's not promising, uh, given that COVID has tended as a global trend to exacerbate already uh, big cleavages between uh, vulnerable populations um, and, and those who were relatively um, uh, relatively sound. But uh, yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you, Salma. Uh, Can I, yes. may I add something on? Yes. Um, I wanted to actually address your earlier question a little bit about budgets and, and things. And I think one of the things that we have seen over time in Iraq, particularly since 2003, obviously, is the rise of a private sector, right? And a, um, so you see this in terms of um, the growth in, in um, private educational uh, schools, private schools being developed, et cetera, um, private hospitals and private and clinics and these sorts of things. And you see um, a real difference also, and then in terms of, um, kind of uh, investments in uh, manufacturing and industry and stuff, and a real shift from the post Ba'athist period for all sorts of reasons. Um, but I think this is where there is a, um, a fair amount of, I feel like Iraqis and the Iraqi government and the Iraqi population um, are, are unclear on exactly where they want to go and what they want to do and whether they want to have a strong and robust public sector that provides health care for all um, that that and and good health care for all and education for all or they want to sort of really open up a private um, a private system that goes along alongside that that um, you know that that allows those who have resources to have a very different sort of um, quality of life and, and experiences. And that probably also comes at the expense of the public because it is through you know, corruption and, and um, siphoning off of public goods that sometimes allows these private um, in industries and private institutions to flourish. And so I think there's a large question there about, about I mean, Russia laid it out really clearly, kind of the, the big issues. But I think there's a bigger, deeper issue that also needs to that Iraqis need to grapple with um, and make decisions on because because the system they have now has been imposed on them by by you know the U.S. Uh, invasion and occupation in 2003, and so it feels like the Iraqis have never quite or or, or that or that conversation has been dominated by people who have a particular um, interest in the way Iraq is, but. Um, I think the other thing that is important about sort of the conversation about all of this money that it, Iraq is a is a is a has a lot of money. I mean, the Iraqi state has a lot of money because it has oil. Where is that all going? the 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 public accounting um, is just not ever put forward, and people don't know. And and so, of course, that allows corruption to to flourish. At, at the same time. Iraqis are amazing people, I mean, historically as well as in the present, who have been able to build and rebuild and create and these sorts of things. So it, it also seems that there need to be opportunities for 
you know, for micro loans, for macro loans, for huge loans, for for Iraqis to to access, you know, some of this funding and to build things that 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 are part of building the Iraqi state and are part of building building Iraq and and for Iraqis, and I don't I don't you know, I don't see those sort of coming forward. It seems like it's much more either concentrated in the hands of the government, and that's a closed, um, you know, that's a closed container that nobody can see, or there's all of these private initiatives that are very mysterious and murky. And there, ne I just think there needs to be a lot more light shown on all of these things. That's true. The private sector in Iraq has a huge potential. Uh, can I uh, ask you for the closing remarks? Uh, Russia, let's start with, let, let's do the speaking order. Uh, thank you, Anas. For the closing remarks, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to agree completely with, with both what my colleagues had just said about uh, regarding loans and urgent aid and priorities where, and as uh, Selma described so well, where you have a population that uh, needs aid immediately and we are still Iraq, the Iraqi state is still dealing with applications from 10 years ago. Now, um, and also as Dr. Davis was saying, yes, the money is there. Since 2003, uh, 2005, sorry, Iraq has allocated $1,500 monthly for every single refugee in the Rafah camp, for example. And these were uh, political refugees that escaped the brutality of the 1991 um, crackdown on the, um, on the revolution in the South at the time, and they had escaped to the camp in Saudi Arabia. And they were within a year or so um, relocated to the United States and Europe and in different places. Uh, and they had um, they received uh, assistance from their hosting states at the time um, and also from the United Nations throughout the years. And since 2005, Iraq has allocated $1,500 every single month for every single individual. There was a period where it stopped for about nine months and they were compensated. Um, these are people that have lived in 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 the US and in Europe and they have their they have built their lives. That money and that is not urgent for them. Whereas you have people that do not have documentation, do not have homes, do not have any kind of shelter, are being kicked out of the small tent that has contained them and um, and protected them for several years now, and they have no place to go, and the government has refused to help them. So it is a matter of priorities. It's just that in the unfortunate situation, politics plays a huge part in this. So perhaps there could be more of an international effort on the country where when it comes to humanitarian cases, it can be definitely at least um, decluttered from all the policies and just focus on saving the people. Um, Dr. Davis mentioned that it was a great opportunity for the government. Investing in its own population is the best PR it can do um, instead of these massive electoral campaigns that are not going to really go anywhere. This, these would just be my closing remarks. And I, I uh, want to thank my colleagues for this brilliant report. And I really hope it gets to the right hands and it can have the impact that it deserves. Thank you, Rasha. Salma, any uh, points we did not make you would like to highlight or propose solutions? <laughs> um, no, I, I would just uh, reiterate, and, and um, as, as Rasha has also really highlighted, um, uh, that that this should not be forgotten. That these are ongoing problems. That that they're real and they pose challenges to people. Um, uh, kind of being able to rebuild their lives, uh, and, and really to to harpen on her last point about um, kind of campaigns. I think. Um, you know, uh, it, it can't just be um, paying lip service to what, uh, but what you should do. I think people are beyond the point um, uh, where they, uh, you know, where, where they really want to put their government, see their government officials putting their money on their mouth, where their mouths are. Um, we did ask uh, in our final survey, what is the one thing that you want, um, uh, you know, government to do? And, um, Partially, the sad part of it was not only that, you know, that we had a number saying that they want compensation, but the other part was we don't trust the government to do anything. They're not going to do anything. They made things worse. Um, so, and that's not a PR battle. That is an actual, you have problems with housing, you have problems with employment, you have problems with services. Those are not things that um, don't have tangible uh, policy um, interventions that could potentially be done. It's just about um, actually doing them. And I'll, I'll give it to Rochelle to kind of reiterate. Doctor, the, the final word is yours. So, um, 
I think as I try to kind of think about this and how I might think about sort of closing, um, I, you know, as we've we've talked about, these are Iraqi citizens. They vote. They are, you know, they are politicians' constituents. They are the nation. They are, and and, and they need to be treated as that. And I, I and Russia has said this, and others, they feel forgotten for the most part. And one of the interesting things we see that indicates that is at the end of our interview transcripts, the um, the um, our respondents almost always thank the IOM, um, the Iraqi uh, member of the IOM team who does the interview for asking about them. And they say things like, thank you so much for coming back or for calling me. You know, nobody ever, nobody ever asks about us and nobody is concerned about us in this way and you always are. And so th there are really, um, there are symbolic things that the Iraqi government or the Iraqi politicians or the Iraqi, you know, local governments can do that would really kind of um, change people's lives by keeping these issues alive, by saying IDPs need, um, need to be part of this, but also by working through the compensation. Um, I mean, I think that that's really a crucial issue is if they would move faster on compensation, you, if, if they could get just a few politicians to take up this issue, that those politicians would get all the votes of all the IDPs because they would they would push through this and make it possible for people to get compensation. In in and and this is these are not large amounts of money that people are asking for. I mean, you know, the 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 people um, people need compensation for you know housing and furniture is 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 oftentimes you know or for agricultural equipment that was that was blown up. Um, I do think that COVID has really um, hit some of these communities much harder. Um, some of the IDP communities much harder because, as Selma showed earlier, there are these. Um, so many people are dependent on uh, informal labor, where they go out and stand in the street and you know get picked up to work in a construction site. Of course, like everywhere in the world, a lot of that stuff shut down, and so it, so IDPs um, were were per perhaps in a more vulnerable position to begin with, and they became even more vulnerable due to COVID. And you know, as we all know suddenly you know having to deal with covid cost more money because your kids had to study at home and we know that many people didn't have abilities for them to you know have smartphones or any kind of computer access let alone connection to the to the internet or to a telephone network that they could do they you know cleaning supplies masks all of the things just even basic and general knowledge about what this meant we all know how difficult that has been to get into people's hands and and um idps are, are no different so so i think as i as i would think about the situation of idps i think there's a real specificity and um and they need to be dealt with but i think secondarily i think the iraqi state and the iraqi government really needs to think about how it addresses poverty in general and as russia mentioned you know even how how difficult life is in the south for so many of the people who live in basra and in the basra areas the one example being that you know selma you know sent me this message a couple of days ago like oh my god iran has cut off power to the south because the Iraqi state has not like paid its uh, paid its power bill to to Iran. Failures like that are catastrophic to people's lives, right? They're catastrophic to pe to people who are who are in hospitals and other you know which of course have generators, but but you know it's a it's a it's a so poverty in general and and the 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 government's concern for its citizens who are who are, who are in these situations needs to be you know on the front on on the front burner of of Iraq's um it needs to shift to thinking you know we're going to you know provide the best universities to saying we need to just make sure that we can we can that we are providing a good life for people um and 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 that's where that's where i think the focus needs to be in general Thank you so much, Dr. Davis, and thank you so much to uh, uh, our three panelists. Uh, this is, as I started the uh, this panel, I say this is a very important topic that unfortunately it's not getting the attention that it deserves. We hope this uh, the report and this discussion and the, the insights that uh, uh, we got today would uh, put an end to this to this tragedy 
because at the end, this will bring stability to the country, to the entire country. And uh, that's something uh, Iraq is definitely needs. Uh, thank you for everyone who uh, stayed with us. Uh, our next panel, uh, our next event is about the oil market uh, and the oil prices. And this so much as well, it affects Iraq because uh, uh, Iraq is the second highest uh, producer and exporter of oil in OPEC, and it's affecting as well the GCC and Iran, who is apparently coming back, uh, could be coming back to the oil market soon. So uh, stay tuned, and uh, we will send more information, publish more information about our upcoming event. Thank you so much again for your time, and uh, we hope to uh, see you in future events. Thank you, Anas. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Anas. Bye.